All right, are everybody ready? We'll go ahead and start and um, we'll start like last week using the eight verses themselves as our motivation. So I'll read through them and let's just really connect with the meaning as best as we can. Determined to obtain the greatest possible benefit from all sentient things who are more precious than a wish fulfilling jewel, I shall hold them most dear at all times. When in the company of others, I shall always consider myself the lowest of all and from the depths of my heart, hold others dear and supreme. Vigilant, the moment a delusion appears in my mind, endangering myself and others, I shall confront and avert it without delay. Whenever I see beings who are wicked in nature and overwhelmed by violent negative actions and suffering, I shall hold such rare ones dear as if I had found a precious treasure. When out of envy, others mistreat me with abuse, insults, or the like, I shall accept defeat and offer the victory to others. When someone whom I have benefited and in whom I have great hopes gives me terrible harm, I shall regard that person as my holy guru. In short, both directly and indirectly, do I offer every happiness and benefit to all my mothers. I shall secretly take upon myself all their harmful actions and suffering. Undefiled by the stains of the superstitions of the eight worldly concerns, may I, by perceiving all phenomena as illusory, be released from the bondage of attachment. Sange churam sogi churam lai janchu badu dani kapsuchi dagi chunyan gi pe sonam ki trola penju sange drupa show. Sange churon sogi chunam la janchu padu dani gapsuchi dagi chenyan gi pe sonam ki rola penje sange drupa show. Sange churon sogi chunam la janchu padu dani gapsuchi dagi chenyan gi pe sonam ki Allowing the motivation to connect and revive. So we did verses one through four. And as I mentioned last week, verses one through four, they do go in order, right? They go from order to the most coarse or immediately applicable to more and more subtle, more and more difficult to take on board, more and more difficult to practice experientially. So those first four were, <laughs> were the easy ones, right? Even though they're not easy at all. And I think that a lot of the themes that were covered in verses one through four, verse one is really trying to help us understand about gratitude and interconnection on a surface level and having that wise selfishness that His Holiness talks about. 
verse two is talking more in terms of cultivating mindfulness and introspection to make sure that distractions don't swamp us, that distractions don't overpower us and kind of blind us to the everyday incidental self-cherishing behaviors that we do that harm ourselves and others. Yeah. And then we get into, you know, the kind of the trickier ones like, you know, managing, managing the way in which we can notice our pride and subdue our pride and the way in which we can notice the bad behavior of other people in a way that doesn't distress us. So, you know, the pride conversation when we're looking at adopting the attitude of being the lowest of all, this is the place in which we first notice the difference between pride and confidence. And we notice the difference between dignity and modesty and humility and humiliation, lack of self-confidence, distorted pride, which is that one that thinks I'm the worst one of all. You're still somehow separate and other and special. You know, it's sort of an inverted pride. Um, it's even in the list of different types of pride, the pride that thinks you're the worst one, you know, and you kind of have some kind of strangely chuffed feeling about being the worst one. You know, no one is better, no one is worse than me. So that kind of pride conversation in the lowest of all verse ties very closely to the conversation in verse five, which is looking then from the jealousy perspective. So, um, you know, they all kind of link together, but it's in, I think it's useful to understand the theme of each one, because although they're all working on getting rid of self-cherishing, there's a different nuance and there's a different emphasis. And then, of course, at the very end, we get into overcoming self-grasping as well. So hopefully we'll have time to really give that one some good air time, because that last verse is particularly um, intriguing and powerful. So we'll go back and just make sure we haven't lost the key terms. So remember Lojong, mind training, thought transformation, is the genre of teachings that the eight verses belongs to. And it's the technique for radical reframing and transformation of suffering. There are many Lojong texts, we're just doing one. So though the historical Buddha Shakyamuni referenced techniques of this type during his lifetime, they became prominent and popularized through the Nalanda tradition of India, and especially emphasized by the Tibetan Buddhist traditions through Lama Atisha, Geshe Chagawa, Langri Tampa, and other great masters. And so the two main projects remember the difference. So self-cherishing, being that deeply ingrained thought that cherishes the welfare of your own self in a way in which that you're oblivious to others' well being. Yeah, not rational, practical self care, not, you know, practical, common sense looking after oneself, but that sort of blinded self consciousness and selfishness that makes you not even notice how much you might be hurting others while trying to get your own needs met. Yeah, you don't mind getting your own needs met even at the expense of others. And then self-cherishing is kind of in a way the symptom of self-grasping, which is even more pervasive. So self-grasping is this instinctively, innately believing in the intrinsic existence or inherent existence of your own self, as well as the external world. So these two thoughts, self-cherishing and self-grasping, are the primary focus of combat in the mind training practice. So because you don't see the self accurately, then you cherish that self that doesn't exist and do behaviors that are unskillful, trying to get happiness and avoid suffering from a whole place of confusion, which is why they're inconsistent and don't have long-term effect that's useful and why you wind up hurting other people in the meantime. So self-cherishing and self-grasping, they're best friends <laughs> or they're master and slave. 
And it is possible to have self-grasping without self-cherishing. Yeah, you can have self-grasping without self-cherishing manifest at least. And that's, that's kind of an interesting conversation, but I think more common is to have a little bit of self-cherishing left, even though you've gotten rid of self-grasping. So an example of this is someone who has realized emptiness directly on the foundational vehicle path. So they're not kind of as swamped by the appearances of inherent existence, but they still have the kind of self-cherishing that doesn't harm others, but also doesn't look to seek their welfare. So it's this kind of like remnants of self-cherishing for even a, you know, a foundational vehicle arahat that prevents them from going to full Buddhahood enlightenment. Yeah, they'll just stop at nirvana liberation and be happy there. <laughs> and they won't be causing trouble and they won't be hurting anyone, but because they still have a little, you know, atmosphere or echo or shadow of self-cherishing in their continuum, they don't go any further with it. They don't have that sense of personal responsibility. So we're working on both of these, but self-cherishing is something that can be right in our face and very easy to see and easy to see the damage that it does. And if we can work on it now, kind of in the beginning of our path, it'll become a habit and a trend that will really be beneficial as we get more advanced as practitioners. Because one thing that happens as you get advanced on the path is that you have more happiness and your practice is deeper, which could mean it's easier to forget about sentient beings because you're not suffering as much. You almost forget how bad suffering can be. <laughs> yeah, um, you're getting more and more focused and more and more blissful in your meditation. And so you might start to forget how difficult a life consumed by distraction is. So if from the very beginning, we can be working on getting rid of self-cherishing, then as we progress, we're not going to leave people behind. Yeah. So it's just, it's something interesting to sit with. So then verse five is the one that I mentioned about jealousy. And it says, when out of envy, others mistreat me with abuse, insults, or the like, I shall accept defeat and offer the victory to others. So this is similar to this lowest of all positioning that is removing yourself from a competitive atmosphere. But this is kind of going a little bit more deeply into what is it that makes people badly behaved? When people are harsh to me, when they insult me, what is that about? It can be about a million different afflictions, right? 84,000 different delusions. But like, let's look at one of this very common ones, which is actually envy. Okay, so if you're thinking about the conflict in your life, particularly when people have treated you badly, to think the person that is treating you badly is in some way jealous of you is kind of a weird thought because you probably, you know, you're a regular person with a regular amount of, of confidence. And so to think, why would they be jealous of me? I'm just a regular person. What are they jealous of exactly? You know, I was thinking about this. Um, I, my mother and I were sharing stories of our youth and various like cowboys shouting at us from pickup truck stories. Yeah, or <laughs> in Australia, it would be youths, right? But you know, there's, a, there's an archetypal late teens, early 20s, you know, kind of a guy who feels like he's going to share his adoration for the female form by shouting aggressive <laughs> at poor women walking by themselves alone, right? It's a universal thing, right? Every culture's got them. Hopefully they grow out of it, right? But I was thinking, all right, abuse, insults, or the like. Are the guys in the truck jealous of the young woman? Like, there's a million things going on for them, right? There's power issues, and there's all sorts of misogyny, patriarchy, yada, yada, we know. But what is the jealousy that they might have? 
could it be here is this young person alone with their youth and vitality joyfully living their life and they kind of wish that they were living a life kind of joyful youthful full of vitality and they want to take you down and rung could that be an element sometimes it's an interesting like way to think of it because normally when we think of insults we're not thinking that the other person might be jealous of us in some way but if there's a way that we can wonder if that's possibly one of the elements it kind of softens you a little bit you think oh man you poor bugger right like don't we all want to be young and vital again or you know haven't we all felt i don't know wanting some sort of romantic connection with someone out of our league you know, especially when we were a teenager, you know, that feeling of wanting someone out of your league and being kind of mad at them that they don't see how cool you are, right? But there's, there's like a jealousy there. And it's just an interesting place to explore because it's not an affliction that gets talked about in everyday society as often as something like attachment or anger. You know, we talk about attachment and anger in all sorts of forms, in all sorts of contexts, but what is our relationship with the idea of jealousy? And from a Buddhist perspective, jealousy is this competitive attitude towards people you see as either peers or higher. And you want what they have or you resent what they have, right? And usually it's looking up, right? Pride is looking down, jealousy is looking up. And in both cases, you're annoyed. <laughs> Right? In both cases, you think, how dare you have, how, how dare you are, how dare you something, it's not fair, right? Or I am just as good as, or I'm even better than, why don't people recognize blah, blah, blah about me? And so there's a real obvious misunderstanding of self there with both pride and jealousy. But what does it do to you to think, or just explore the possibility that some of the most insulting, critical people in your life were jealous of you in some way. What, is it, what impact does that have on your mind? Does it feel like there could be a truth to it, even if there's a bunch of other things going on? No, and you wonder, okay, maybe they're just jealous of the time I get with somebody that they'd like to get time with maybe they're jealous of my joy <laughs> you know maybe i'm just kind of happy and they're annoyed that i'm happy because they'd like to be happy you know what jealousy can be about so many things it doesn't have to be about material wealth it doesn't have to be about socially constructed ideas of beauty it can be about a million things and so to kind of consider sometimes when people insult us they're jealous Hmm. Do you have resistance to that idea? Or um, examples that are okay to share in public? <laughs> I have an example. Yeah. And I'm feeling a bit bad about it now because, sorry, I'm a little bit sick, so my voice is a bit weird. Um, well, um, someone that I know, I was very close to my, my cousin. Um, she got jealous of a relationship I was having with my best friend. And um, she, didn't, she didn't voice it in a way like, you know, I don't know, like she actually put something on Facebook about it, <laughs> um, which is absolutely ridiculous. So this is what happened. Like I was at the beach with my best friend and her kids and my cousin decided to put something on, on Facebook that I would be where my best friend is all the time, regardless of what's happening in the world, blah, 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 whatever it is. So I got quite annoyed with her because I thought there was no reason for her to do anything like this. I was very confused about it. And I didn't actually understand if it was jealousy or I didn't know what it was. Um, and I decided, um, I realized afterwards that it was jealousy because there was no reason for her to attack me in that way. And I decided to stop talking to her because that wasn't the first time that that's happened. It's probably about the fifth time. And I haven't spoken to her in two years now. 
And I feel really, really bad because in a lot of ways, um, I feel that I should probably have just let her do whatever she was doing or say whatever she was saying and just ignore it and move on. But I didn't. But this is for me an example of how jealousy affected me and how I actually lost a relationship because, because of that. Yeah. Yeah. It, it does happen, doesn't it? And somehow we hold on to resentment about the bad behavior that came our way. And we completely ignore the suffering underneath it. And I mean, what's an easier suffering to relate to than jealousy in terms of just seeing how it's suffering? You know, I mean, you can see how anger is suffering. You know, you're all boiling mad and you're all red and you're all shaky, but there's also kind of a power and a kind of life force in anger that sometimes people enjoy as well. So it's uncomfortable, but you sort of feel strong. Whereas with jealousy, you just feel awful. You know, with jealousy, you just have such a, um, it's, it's not fair, or why do I never get, or why do they always get, or why do, uh, you know, what are, why do these good things never happen to me, you know, what's wrong with me, and there's a lot of just like, me, <laughs> but, you know, it's not necessarily childish, you can really touch some very deep wounds, you know, about deprivations that we might have experienced as children or deprivations that we might have experienced as adults growing up, things that just didn't come together for us, you know, or things that once were together and then fell apart. And so jealousy, it's just like, it's heart wrenching because there's this longing and this even desperation and just this incredibly melancholy rage <laughs> in jealousy, isn't there? It's like, it's so, it's just sad and angry and just all conflicted and tangled. And it means that you cannot celebrate the good things happening for other people. You know, the opposite of jealousy is rejoicing. And when you're in rejoicing in a really authentic, connected way, you are happier when you see people happy. You know, if you see someone having a really healthy relationship with great communication, you're just like, oh, yes, excellent. You know, and you see someone get a new house and a new puppy and their garden is really flourishing. You're thinking, oh, that makes them so happy. I'm so glad they have that going for them. You know, when you don't have jealousy, other people's joy gives you even more joy and it becomes just this like ripple effect of joy, doesn't it? Jealousy just kind of suffocates your ability to have a connected, empathic, happy when you see other people happy. So if you can remember personally and experientially how painful jealousy is those times when it's gotten a hold of you, then when you see it mirrored in other people, you really, your heart goes out to them, you know? you know the darkness they've put themselves into by being in that way. And so it doesn't mean you accept their criticism or their insults or their bad behavior in a logistical way. You might have to say, you can't speak to me that way. <laughs> I'm sorry, you can't, you know, it's not healthy for you. It's not healthy for me. It's not good for the family. It's not good for the workplace. You might need to say things like that, but internally you don't have that same feeling of woundedness or that same feeling of defensiveness or that same feeling of confused why are you being so mean to me I'm just living my life you know because you deeply get where they're coming from and your heart is just open and you would never retaliate and you would never punish and you would never have plans of retribution of you insulted me, just wait, I'll get you. I'll come up with a zinger. I'll fabricate some excellent sarcasm and show you. You don't do that because your heart is just like, oh, that's a rough spot. Yep. Do you know? So when out of envy, others mistreat me with abuse, insults or the like, I shall accept defeat. So that's going even farther, isn't it? Than just not retaliating, not answering back, to accept the defeat 
and offer the victory, man, that's like pro level Bodhisattva stuff. You know, that's like epic to say, not only will I take all of this garbage you're dumping on me and like accept it, I'm going to go even further and say, you win, <laughs> you know, which sounds again, like terrible boundaries, like codependency, like martyrdom, like, you know, being taken advantage of. And that is never what mind training is about. But a lot of people do hear it the wrong way and think now I have to never acknowledge my own needs and I never have to honor my own personhood and people get to walk all over me because I'm a good bodhisattva and, you know, <laughs> and you go into humiliation rather than humility, you know. So you hear it as I am content enough and I am stable enough and I am filled with abundance enough that again, competition is not something that needs to be in my life. Yeah, just like the lowest of all one. It's a similar mentality where you're just like stepping out of the competition. And you're not kind of, you're not doing it in a proud way that says, I'm too good to be in this drama. I'll just give it to you. You know, that's easy to do if we're being a little snarky in our mind and it's like snarky mind training. You know, this is very dangerous, right? But it can happen where we're like, I am better than this drama. I'm out, you know? And you have like a tiny drag queen inside of you who like tosses their hair, right? No, right? Like have her, that's fine. But, you know, don't use it, the mind training in this way. We don't want to be petty is the point right? Everything about mind training is an invitation to get over being petty. Yeah, and to get over being superficial, and to get over holding grudges and blaming people for their pain, and all of the things that happen when people are in pain. You know, because we're seeing pain, we're not, you know, we're seeing there's bad behavior there, but we're immediately going to, no one is like this, out of nowhere. No one is badly behaved out of nowhere. Everyone badly behaved is struggling in an epic way. And I want to give them more suffering by withholding my love, withholding my affection, or putting them in their place and, you know, dominating them or, you know, something like that. Like, why would we do that? So, if you're doing these verses and lots of people use them as their everyday motivation, and I, I really recommend if you can to do it, it's such a short practice, but to just kind of like touch into each one to get you out of the petty mind, you know, and it just, it relaxes you into this spaciousness. And I think also what happens when you're not in competitive thinking is that you're also able to see your own absurdity and your own part in dramas without the same need to defend it. Yeah. Which again, makes the atmosphere a lot more relaxed and makes moving through conflict so much easier. Yeah. Yeah, any, any other thoughts about that one? It's, you know, intellectually not hard, but it, it is really, really full on to think of offering the victory to someone who's been really awful to you, <laughs> you know? I think if it's one off, you can offer the victory, but if it's repetitive, if it's some, if, you know, it happens again and again and again and again, how, how do you, how do you deal with that then? Well, the mentality is the same. It's just your external choices might be different. You know, what we're saying is that if your mind is stable and clear and you're feeling grounded and open hearted, then you can try many different strategies to deal with the conflicts in your life. And if they work, that's great. If they don't, it doesn't disturb your peace. So one day you might try nonviolent communication. <laughs> And one day you might, you know, try group therapy. And one day you might try, let's just do an activity and cook together. And one day you might try an intervention and really directly confront them head on. And one day a, a kindly worded letter. And one day a lawsuit. It doesn't even matter, right? It's that if the place you're coming from is stable 
and your heart is open, then you can be creative about your choices and not so invested in outcome. Because you really are saying to yourself again and again, whatever happens, happiness or suffering, harmony or conflict, all of it is fuel for the path. All of it is fuel for my path. And the part of me that feels wronged is most likely the self that isn't there at all. And if I don't have challenges like this in my life, I might never see how strong the facade is that I try and maintain my whole life and how much it blocks me from transformation and progress. So, you know, so don't feel like you have to try the same thing you've been trying the whole time externally and just keep hitting your head against the wall being like a nice person. Try something else, you know, try being direct if you've been indirect and vice versa. It's just, you keep coming back to where do I start from? And where I start from needs to be as close to bodhicitta as I'm able to touch at my level. Yeah, because, you know, then it, whatever happens, you've not created more negative karma, you've not created more fuel for conflict, and you've actually progressed on your path. Because there's not going to be an end to conflict, is there? Even if you work it out with that one person, and it's like, done and dusted and totally settled and yay now we have a harmonious relationship you'll just meet someone else who's obnoxious right like <laughs> there's no end to obnoxious people right? and there's probably no end to our karma to experience them <laughs> unless we start doing some really proactive purification and practice right yeah like be nice to yourself about it though okay because you know it's rough when it's repetitive it really is and when it's in your face and you don't get a break and you really just need some some space and some support acknowledge that you know you're allowed to have space and you're allowed to have support and seek them out you know you're not a bad practitioner for needing backup yeah yes i, I wanted to know if um there is a, because when I imagine like myself or somebody which is dealing with jealousy, uh, sometimes to, to tell, yes, you are right or take it like it's for you. It doesn't matter. No worries. They take it badly and they became like more jealous, like, oh, you are giving me that. So you're that good or and I wanted to know how to deal with that because it makes them suffering even more <laughs> when yeah. you don't play the game. Yeah. Yeah, totally. It, it, I'm sure all of us have this experience with our non-Buddhist friends and family where like if we're the one that's being hard work that day, if we're being a little bit impatient or irritable or something, they say to us, you're not being a very good Buddhist, are you? <laughs> right and we have this or um or someone will be like drinking alcohol and then they'll apologize to us um you know this this will happen right is that good behavior will aggravate people that are in the mood to be aggravated it totally will and we need like pro-level empathy to know when is the time when accepting defeat and offering the victory looks like self-deprecating humor where we can make fun of ourselves and just genuinely own that we are absurd and full of hypocrisy, you know, and just like own it. And that's what offering the victory looks like some days. Mm -hmm. Some days it looks like genuinely validating them in a way that's not patronizing or condescending. You know, it looks like you find some of their qualities and you tell them that you see them. But for mm -hmm. some people, that's going to piss them off, isn't it? So you have to have your like empathy ears wide open to know when is the time for humor? When is the time for patience? When is the time for just clear, direct speech? Mm -hmm. The problem is that we want to preempt the present with a plan that's like guaranteed to work. And then we start to think of the eight verses as this plan that's guaranteed to work in my speech and behavior forgetting that it's a plan that's guaranteed to work for your thoughts, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's a plan that will definitely work if you understand and have connected with them and you're just reminding yourself, it's definitely going to work for your heart. 
but what you say from that place and what you do from that place, we don't have enough information to be certain what's going to be the most useful thing. We just have to do our best and let go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So part of these verses is also helping us kind of be ready for anything. You know, I'll just, I'm going to speak from an open heart and they'll get it or they won't. I'm not trying to manipulate the present or trying to change them. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to change me into a thing that is much more expansive and can hold more reactions without becoming reactive myself. Yeah. I think you should begin like small, like work. Yeah. On it, yeah. yeah. Small, it's offer small it. victories. Yeah. 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 Thank so, you. Yeah. Someone cuts you off in traffic. You just wave. <laughs> Right, start small. Yeah, Margo. And if it doesn't work, if you try a strategy and it doesn't work, then you think like Yonten and you say, may it go better next time. Right. Okay, That's this very is helpful. Said done. That's very helpful. Yeah. Yep. And I mean, offering the victory can be much more subtle than some obvious conversation or obvious argument, like I was thinking how I should have offered the victory. Like yesterday I was running errands and I had to pick up a prescription and the guy filling the prescription said, oh, for the blah, 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 like loudly to everyone. And, you know, like, fortunately it was not like something embarrassing, but, you know, I was kind of like, that is a violation of ethics <laughs> to say that out loud in public. You pharmacist. I'm going to write a strongly word letter, you know, and what I said was, um, some people use it for that. Yes. Do you have it? And there was a little bit of an edge in my voice that was communicating some displeasure, you know, and, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, I would have read in the riot act and been like, how dare you blah, blah, blah. What if I had been someone very vulnerable or with a mental health issue or something and how dare you, but you know, at least, at least the Dharma kicked in enough that I was just a little bit brusque, <laughs> right? But still, I could have offered him the victory, you know, in a, in a way that was not punishing him for the slip of the tongue. I could have even said something funny and made him relax, done my business, and then quietly spoken to him and said, hey, actually, when you said what the medication was for out loud to everyone, I can imagine a case where someone would be really humiliated by that. And also it's an ethical violation. And I just, you know, I just want to speak from my heart that please don't do that to people. I'm fine, but please don't do that to people. That's what I should have done, right? <laughs> Rather than just kind of like communicate my displeasure in a kind of like abstract way. He doesn't know why I'm so grumpy unless he had enough self-awareness to know he did the wrong thing. You know, so like offering the victory can take a million different forms, but it can be also not punishing people for making mistakes, particularly in public, particularly when we feel self-righteous. You know, at, at Dharma centers, there's the, um, I don't know, stereotype of the Dharma police. You know, the Dharma police, yes, those of you at Dharma centers. So like some brand new volunteer is doing the water bowls and they're not doing them correctly in some way. And, you know, there are also many correct ways, which is a whole other piece, but like, so they're not doing them the, the correct way. And some like well-intended senior student says, you're not doing it right, you know? And do you know, if you don't do it right, this and this and this will happen. And like the poor person is just trying to help. Offering the victory could be gently explaining and rejoicing that they're helping you know, rather than needing to be the dominant one, rather than needing to be the right one, you know, rather than showing off of knowing more, et cetera, et cetera. So like take this in whatever way really is applicable to you as an individual. Where is it where you kind of need to win? You know, where in an ordinary day with ordinary interactions with the people around you, do you have an edge that needs to dominate and kind of needs the upper hand energetically? Yeah, because that is that is self-cherishing, right? 
that one that feels like they need to have the upper hand. And it feels like it's defending you and helping you when in fact it's making you more isolated and alienated. You know, so it's, it's personal kind of what your version of this is gonna look like, but um, you know, do the deep dive. <laughs> So then this one is going even more hardcore into betrayal, right? So this is someone whom I have benefited and in whom I have great hopes, gives me terrible harm. I shall regard that person as my holy guru. Who are we regarding as our holy guru? The one we helped, the one we had great hopes in, but turned around and, you know, bit us in the back. That one. So, you know, it's, it's different to the betrayals you might have experienced when you were in the subordinate position or you were in the vulnerable position. Those betrayals are hard and horrible. Sure, absolutely, 100%. But the betrayals we're talking about are kind of in a way the things that have happened to us since becoming somewhat grounded adults. Yeah, adults with expectations. So, I mean, the most common case of this is parents with children, right? So your children, you've benefited them and you've fed them and you've watered them and you've been nice to them for however many years and they turn around and do something really terrible to you or your partner cheats on you or your coworker, you know, takes a promotion from you, something like that, where there was a good relationship it was good, it was healthy, and you put a lot of energy into it, and they repaid your kindness with harm. This is the, one of the most useful people in your life, isn't it? Because it shows you how conditional was your love. Yeah, what were your expectations? What was the business deal you made in your mind about, I will be this nice to you if you are this nice to me. You know, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Like how much did you have an agenda with your kindness? That's why this one is epic because they're showing you what was actually love and what was attachment. And without someone betraying you, so I guess smacking you in your face with it, someone who you really cared about, without someone like that doing the dirty on you, you're not gonna ever really know experientially how much love as opposed to how much attachment in the relationship. It almost takes something like this for you to become sure. So if someone that you have great hopes in, who you've benefited a lot, has done you terrible harm and you feel, what's going on with them? Are they okay? Like what's happening for them? What can I do? If that's your immediate response, then the percentage of that relationship that was love was high. If your response is, what is wrong with you? <laughs> then the percentage of the relationship that was attachment is high. Yeah. So it's, it's the, what was your reaction? What's wrong? Or what's wrong with you? <laughs> you know, that's a good gauge. And we know all of our relationships have a mixture of love and attachment and love and attachment can't be at the same exact time. They alternate. Yeah, you can't have two opposite states of mind in the mind at the same time. So it might feel like this person I always love, but right now I'm irritated at you. When in fact you love them, love stopped and now you're irritated. And then, you know, love comes again. But to kind of like take away the sugar coating of whatever your internal narrative is when there is conflict like this that says, I love them, I was just mad at them. It's like, well, while you were mad at them, you were not loving them because mad at them is the wish to harm. And they didn't live up to your expectations and now you're gonna punish them for that. And that's not our path, right? The punishment might be very polite. It might be socially acceptable. It might just be the silent treatment, right? But it's still a wish to harm to like communicate, you have not lived up to my expectations. You know, so I'm gonna, you know, cat bum. You know, 
right? Or I'm going to say something or I'm going to whatever, but this is an interesting one. Like who in our life have we really put a lot of time into and a lot of love into? If they turned around and did the wrong thing, how would we react? And just kind of like, before it happens, think about it. How would you react if your partner cheated on you? How would you react if your child stole from you? How would you react if your best friend, I don't know, did but revealed a secret that they should never reveal, something like that? Hopefully they won't ever do it, but it's it's an interesting thought experiment to ask yourself, internally, what would I do? Externally, what would be skillful? What are your thoughts about that one? Can you not only forgive them, not only take it on the path, but actually see them as your holy guru, as the one that has taught you the very most? Yeah, Heather, yeah. I certainly, it's not difficult to, I, I can think of many examples, including in just in the last week where the most difficult person that I encounter um, really is the best reflection of where I'm at in my path that I, you know, go from being on my cushion and super blissed out to just screaming like a lunatic. And, you know, so that I do understand that I get, I guess it's just semantics, but the, the idea of a holy guru, that seems really hard to put that on a person that is displaying characteristics that are in contradiction to the ethical framework that I've committed my life to. So, you know, yeah. I get it conceptual. Yeah, and it's, it's not accidental that it's challenging semantics, like, it, because the question is who teaches you more? You know, right. the one that is kind and sweet to you or the one who does the dirty? Like, what is showing you more about your level of practice? Who right. is teaching you more? So it's like the teacher in this context, they don't have to have any plan to teach you. <laughs> They're not intending to teach you. They don't think, I'm going to do this horrible thing and see where your practice is at. Rah. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's kind of where we get stuck with a lot of these is we don't want to give badly behaved people credit for you know helping us wake up to ourselves or the resiliency that we've built because of the terrible things they've done you know so we may have developed patience and resiliency and compassion to others and a broader understanding of the human condition because of this really problematic person in our life they've been our best teacher better than any dharma teacher because they're the ones that forced practice Right. But we don't want to give them that, you know, because they were they didn't want to. <laughs> they didn't want to. And also there's like a, when I think about gurus, I, there's a there's a great deal of reverence for that person. I mean, and I guess I'm even as I'm saying it out loud, I'm understanding what you're saying. But it's not the reverence for the person necessarily. It's the reverence for the what I'm learning, maybe. Or, yeah. But it, it's just hard to think of, you know, Geshe Shara is somebody that I revere. And then this idiot. Yeah. That, right. you know, I mean, it's just it's like, you don't belong on the same, you know, that's very challenging for yeah, me. Yeah, it is. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. yeah. 100% um, intentionally. Right. Yeah. And even what if you were to take, you know, and, and Geshla is amazing. I, you know, we love him in the Blue Mountains. He comes to, to Kunsan Yeshi a lot as well. So like, take him, he's amazing, right? And, you know, so patient and so skillful and all of these things that our hard work person is not. It's almost like the antithesis of our actual teacher that we've made a relationship with. But to even think, what if I was to have that amount of reverence and gratitude what would change in the relationship? You know, and of course, initially you're like, ew, no, gross. I don't want to, right? No, <laughs> right? And there's like a little kid in you that's like, mm -mm. <laughs> right? But, you know, what if actually it was more than just a kind of respect for the learning? What if you even went a few steps further and thought, thank you, thank you 
thank you. It's man, that's the that's the deep work. And to not force it, you know, don't force it. But you know, I really, if I can step back from my own history, I can have that kind of almost warmth towards the worst people. Yeah. And I'm not saying their behavior was okay. It wasn't. I'm not saying they should do it again. They shouldn't, you know, but that doesn't matter in terms of without them, I would be less, you know, and your parents saying, oh, this hard work is good for you. It builds character. And you kind of want to say, shut up. Life shouldn't be hard like that. And yet what has built character (laughs) besides hardship? You know, it's just that you have to come to that conclusion voluntarily from your own free will. You can't have it forced on you or force fed to you, you know, because as soon as you feel like I have to think this way or a good person thinks this way and you start trying to force it, you'll have a rebellion, you know, and you'll say to hell with that and you'll rage, you know. Yeah. Yeah, so it has to be voluntary where you're just genuinely stepping back and going, honestly, that was the most useful thing. I don't like to say that, that is uncomfortable, but it was. Well, and I can see that in this specific instance that when I kind of sat with it, you know, he was trying to take credit for something that I had done. And, you know, if I really am rigorously honest with myself, I want credit too. We both want credit, right? And so that's the part where I'm not just doing this out of the goodness of my heart. I'm doing it so that I get credit and it doesn't matter what, you know, all those things that I'm like, Ur! and yeah. I accept that that's a place where I can grow, but I still don't want anything to do with this person. I still, you know. Yeah. And it's similar to, you know, when we talk about equanimity, it makes it sound like you have to make every relationship the same when that's not what's happening. You're trying to have equal goodwill while Mm -hmm. acknowledging the labels come from you, right? So in in the same case, it's like, you don't have to pretend to have the same rapport with this person that you do with Geshe-la, you know? You don't have to pretend to have the same yearning for closeness <laughs> or you know I want to absorb their wisdom or you know all of those other associations you have with the teacher you don't have to transfer the whole guru basket onto this person you know just like with equanimity you don't have to have the same rapport with the enemy as you do with the friend you're just trying to have the same amount of goodwill yeah regardless of the label right yeah. so similarly it's like with real guru and mind training guru you're holding them in equal height you know and equal reverence and equal gratitude and equal you have taught me what i need but not necessarily now i'm going to go hang out with you every weekend like i go see geshla at class <laughs> you know I'm going to go sit at your feet. Please be awful to me this week. What shall I learn this week? I'll take notes, you know? (laughs) Yeah. So not the same, not that way, I guess, if that helps. Yeah, very much. (laughs) Yeah. So anyway, um, we'll have a, like a five minute break and then we'll do a meditation. Yeah. Five minutes then meditation. (laughs) 